Hi, my name is Connie Kuklanas and you're watching the video on torsion. In this video, we'll be discussing torsion that is caused by a cyclovertical muscle palsy. And in a subsequent video, we'll be discussing how to go about measuring torsion. Okay, so when a cyclovertical muscle is palsied, what it can cause is a cyclotropia. And this will be the eyes misaligned around the anterior-posterior axis. From the patient's perspective, subjectively, they will report that the diplopic image is tilted. And it's important that you elicit the information around tilt because often the patients won't report the tilt. They may indicate that they have double vision, but you need to specifically ask if the diplopic image is tilted to determine if there is torsion. Now, the torsion that will be experienced or the cyclo tropia that will be caused by a cyclovertical muscle being palsied will obviously be dependent on which muscle is palsied. Now remember that the diplopia will always be opposite to the deviation and this applies to cyclodeviations. So if an eye is encycloducted or there's an encyclotropia, the image will be extorted. So recall the superior muscles, the superior oblique and the superior rectus are in cycloadductors, which means that if this muscle is palsied, the eye will rotate in the opposite direction and cause an excyclotropia. And as I just mentioned, an excyclotropia will cause the image to be intorted or the patient to experience intorsion. Okay, the inferior oblique and the inferior rectus are obviously excyclodactors. They cause an encyclotropia, which means the diplopic image will be extorted. Now let's look at this a little bit more visually. What we can see here is we have a right eye that's excycloducted, and the black line here is depicting that the eye is rotated towards the ear. So the expectation here is that if this eye is excycloducted, the image that the patient will see is intorted. Okay, it will be opposite to the rotation of the eye. If we take the encycloducted eye here, the black line you can see is moving towards the nose for the right eye. And therefore, the image that the patient will see will be extorted, the opposite to the rotation of the eye. Let's now go through how a patient experiences torsion, or more specifically, how they will report the image being tilted, particularly when you present them with a linear line. I'll take you through what the patient will report if you present them a vertical line, versus if you present them a horizontal line. And this is important in particular in relation to using investigations such as double maddox rod or Bagalini strider glasses, which we'll see in a moment. So let's start off with this vertical line here. What I want you to do is take on the perspective of the patient and that to this side is your ear and to this side is your nose. And you're looking at this with your right eye. Now, what you should imagine is that if the image is extorted, the line will be towards your ear. So this is an extorted vertical image. However, if it is intorted, it will be moving towards your nose. This is an intorted image. Okay, so this will differ for the left eye. If you present this to the left eye and it's the left eye that's encycloducted or excycloducted, then what you have is this is your nose and towards this uh, area is your ear. So this is now an extorted image which is moving towards your ear versus this being an intorted image which is moving towards your nose. However, it differs if you present a horizontal line. Here we have a horizontal line. So if you present the patient with a horizontal line and it is the right eye that has the cyclotropia, then if it moves in this way, in this direction, so upwards from this end, you have extorsion, versus if it moves downwards from this end, we've got intorsion. And so what we see here is the line that represents extorsion if you present the patient with horizontal line, versus this um, line which represents intorsion. And you can see that this is opposite to what the patient has presented here, which is intorsion for the right eye when I presented the image vertically, versus when I presented the image horizontally. Okay, so just be aware that dependent on how you present the image 
what the patient reports to you could differ and represent intorsion or extorsion depending on how you presented the image. Now, practically speaking, the investigations you perform to measure torsion will provide you with the answer as to whether the eye is excyclorotated or encyclorotated or if you've got an encyclotropia versus an excyclotropia. However, you should be aware that if you're trying to match what the patient has said and what the tests have told you, that it will matter how you presented the image to the patient or what the patient is looking at in reporting the tilted image. Now, it's important to remember that small amounts of torsion can be overcome using your cyclovergences. We're not only able to overcome vertical disparity and horizontal disparity with our fusion range, we're also able to overcome torsional disparity. Generally speaking, patients can fuse up to around six to eight degrees of torsion. Okay, so if a palsy causes a small cyclo deviation, it is possible for a patient to overcome this through their cyclovergences. In this instance, what will be noted is a cyclophoria. However, during cover testing, generally the only observation you'll make is the vertical and the horizontal deviation. It's very difficult to observe cyclo deviations and cyclophorias. Another thing to note is that where patients have had a congenital palsy, they are able to adapt to torsion. What this means is that the patient will not report that they have torsion. You'll ask them about tilt, they'll tell you that the image is not tilted. However, objectively, you will find that there is a cyclo deviation and that the eye is excycler or encycler rotated. What this also means is that where a patient does complain of torsion or a tilted image, then it's likely to be an acquired palsy rather than a congenital palsy because we know that congenital palsy is tend to adapt to torsion. So in summary, a couple of things to remember. When we have a cyclovertical muscle palsy, the eye will rotate in the opposite direction to the muscle's cyclovertical action. So if that extracular muscle is an encycloadductor, then you'll have an encyclorotated eye or you'll have excyclotropia. And remember then the torsion will be the opposite to the deviation which means that the patient will experience intorsion in this particular example. Now remember, patients have the capacity to overcome torsion and probably about two, six to eight degrees of torsion can be overcome through cyclovergences. And the last thing to know is that patients can adapt to torsion and not report subjective tilt or not report subjective torsion. In these instances, you're generally looking at a patient who's had a long-standing congenital cyclovertical palsy. Okay, that brings us to the conclusion of this video. Thank you for watching.